Hello and welcome to the Minimum Competence episode for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. I'm your host for today, Andrew Leahy, a tax and technology attorney from New Jersey. In today's episode, we have the Ninth Circuit looking at Meta's citizenship bias, Trump era CMS rule struck by judge, SBF's trial rolls on, and the judge in Trump's case pounds his fist in frustration. Been there, bro. Let's run headlong into Thursday and see if the momentum blasts us right through to the weekend, but also read today's legal news. On this day in legal history, October 5th, 1941, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis died at the age of 84. Louis Brandeis was born on November 13th, 1856 in Louisville, Kentucky. He graduated from Harvard Law School at the age of 20 with the highest grade point average in the school's history. In 1890, he gained recognition for developing the right to privacy concept through an article in the Harvard Law Review. Brandeis was a prominent figure in the antitrust movement and was known for his resistance to monopolies, particularly in the New England railroad sector. He also advised Woodrow Wilson and was critical of large banks and powerful corporations in his writings. Brandeis became active in the Zionist movement, viewing it as a solution to anti-Semitism in Europe and Russia. He was often referred to as the people's lawyer and took cases without pay to focus on broader issues. He set a new precedent in evidence presentation with the Brandeis Brief, which utilized expert testimony from various professions. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson nominated him to the U.S. Supreme Court, making him the first Jewish member. His nomination was met with significant opposition, but was eventually confirmed by the Senate. During his tenure on the Supreme Court from 1916 to 1939, Brandeis became one of the most influential justices in history. He was known for his strong defenses of freedom of speech and the right to privacy. However, he has been criticized for not addressing issues related to African Americans and for supporting racial segregation in some cases. Brandeis retired from the Supreme Court on February 13, 1939, and passed away on October 5th, this day in 1941, in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit is set to hear a case concerning Meta Platforms, Inc., the parent company of Facebook, and its alleged preference for hiring workers on H-1B visas. The case, brought by appellant Rajaram, questions whether U.S. citizens are a protected class under Section 1981 of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. A federal district court previously dismissed the case, stating that the act does not cover reverse discrimination claims. Rajaram's lawyers argue that Section 1981 should be broadly interpreted to include U.S. citizens, while Meta contends that the law has traditionally been applied narrowly to race or alien status. The case also brings into focus Meta's hiring practices. The company is one of the top H-1B employers in fiscal year 2022, with over 1,500 approved petitions for new workers. Rajaram, a naturalized U.S. citizen, claims that Meta's hiring policies favor workers on H-1B visas over equally or more qualified U.S. citizens. If Rajaram wins, it could discourage companies from prioritizing H-1B workers over U.S. citizens. The Department of Justice and the Department of Labor have previously scrutinized Meta's H-1B hiring practices. The company settled those claims by paying over $14 million in civil penalties without admitting any wrongdoing. Rajaram's lawsuit aims to address citizenship discrimination in hiring more broadly, not just positions earmarked for visa workers. Experts note that the structure of the H-1B program itself may contribute to competition between visa holders and U.S. workers. Companies have little incentive to pay H-1B workers more than a prevailing wage, leading them to file as many petitions as possible for minimally qualified candidates. Oral arguments in the case began yesterday. A federal judge has ordered the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, to withdraw a trump arrow rule concerning copay assistance programs. The rule had been challenged by patient advocacy groups, including the HIV plus Hepatitis Policy Institute and the Diabetes Leadership Council, who claimed it allowed health plans to increase out-of-pocket prescription drug costs. Judge John D. Bates stated that the rule conflicted with the Affordable Care Act's definition of cost-sharing and must be set aside. The 2020 rule had stated that pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs who manage prescription drug benefits for insurers were not required to count drug maker copay assistance towards patients' out-of-pocket costs. The patient groups argued that this allowed PBMs and health plans to collect funds from both patients and drug makers without using the money to ease the financial burden on patients. The ruling is seen as a victory for these patient advocacy groups who filed the lawsuit in August of 2022. Carl Schmidt, the executive director of the HIV plus Hepatitis Policy Institute, expressed satisfaction with the court's decision and called on the Biden administration to enforce it immediately. The advocacy groups are backed by pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Abbott Laboratories, and Eli Lilly, as well as Merck Co. While these companies can offer assistance to patients in commercial plans, such programs are prohibited in government-funded health insurance due to the anti-kickback statute. The Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, had previously argued that manufacturer coupons could add long-term costs to the healthcare system, outweighing the short-term benefits. Both the Department of Justice, representing CMS and HHS, and a CMS spokesperson declined to comment on the ruling. 
The case is titled HIV and Hepatitis Policy Institute v. the Department of Health and Human Services and was filed on September 29th, 2023. Trial of Sam Bankman-Fried, founder of the collapsed FTX cryptocurrency exchange, has begun with both sides presenting differing views on the reasons behind the company's failure. SBF is accused of using FTX customer funds to support his hedge fund, Alameda Research, as well as for personal expenditures like luxury real estate and political donations. He has pleaded not guilty to these charges. His defense lawyer, Mark Cohen, portrayed him as a math nerd from MIT who may have overlooked risk management but did not engage in theft. Prosecutor Thane Rain, however, argued that Bankman-Fried took more than $10 billion from FTX customers and used the funds to build his empire through fraudulent means. Rain stated that the defendant doubled down on risky investments when Alameda began losing money. The prosecution plans to call three former associates of Bankman-Fried, all of whom have pleaded guilty and agreed to cooperate to testify against him. The defense suggested that these witnesses might retrospectively portray Bankman-Fried's decisions as deceitful, even though they had agreed with those decisions at the time. The jury for the trial includes a diverse group of individuals, including a retired investment banker, a school librarian, and a train conductor. Bankman-Fried has been in detention since August 11th for likely tampering with witnesses. The trial comes nearly a year after the collapse of FTX, which had a significant impact on financial markets and damaged Bankman-Fried's reputation. It promises to offer an inside look into the operations of a cryptocurrency exchange and the legal boundaries within which such businesses operate. Judge Arthur N. Gorin, overseeing Donald Trump's civil fraud trial in New York, expressed frustration with Trump's legal team for what he termed as ridiculous and redundant questioning of a witness. The trial is centered on allegations by the New York Attorney General's office that Trump inflated his net worth by billions to secure better loan and insurance terms. And Gorin, who is the sole decider of the case's outcome, has already disciplined Trump's lawyers for making frivolous arguments. Earlier, and Gorin had imposed a gag order on public comments about court staff after Trump criticized the judge's top law clerk on social media. Trump, who has been present in court, has consistently attacked both the judge and New York Attorney General Letitia James, labeling them as corrupt and the case as a sham. Last week, Ngoran ruled that Trump, his two adult sons, and 10 of his companies had committed fraud. He revoked the business certificates for key assets, including Trump Tower and 40 Wall Street, and said he would appoint receivers for their dissolution. Trump's lawyers have appealed this decision. The trial mainly concerns the assessment of damages, with James seeking at least $250 million in fines and various bans against Trump and his sons from conducting business in New York. The trial is expected to continue until mid-December. Trump, as we have covered ad nauseum, also faces other legal challenges, including four criminal indictments and a civil damages trial scheduled for January. He has, of course, denied wrongdoing in all cases. And with that, I thank you so much for listening to Minimum Competence, your daily news podcast for lawyers. If you're looking for more than Minimum Competence, links to further reading on all the topics touched on today are in the show notes. If you have any questions or story suggestions, you can find us on Mastodon on the ESQ.social instance. I'm at Andrew and my co-host Gina is at Gina. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and do not represent those of any organization we may be affiliated with. Nothing here should be construed as legal advice because it is not legal advice. And reviews go a long way towards helping new listeners to find our show. If you have a moment, leave a rating or review on your podcast player. We'd sure appreciate it. And if you know someone that might be interested in a story we cover, consider sending them the episode. Minimum Competence is available at minimumcomp.com and wherever it is you get your finely crafted podcasts. If you haven't checked out the website in a while, give it a look. There are complete transcripts and resources for each episode and its corresponding segments, as well as an opportunity to receive new episodes in email newsletter form should that happen to be your jam. All of the links to stories we cover will also be available on links.esq.social, which is our link aggregator in the Fediverse. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And until then, remember, sunlight is said to be the best disinfectant, electric light, the most efficient policeman. 